Today's episode is proudly brought to you by Ambezi. Purpose is actually what allows for adaptability. Because if you know the ultimate direction that you're headed in, um, then, then that allows you to try many different ways of getting there. Uh, and I think that's what's so powerful about it. Purpose isn't a skill that you can, that you need to learn. Um, it's not a profession that you need to enter. It's something that's with you always. Hello, my name's Rebecca Tapp and welcome to Decoding Purpose. The word purpose has worked its way into part of our everyday vocabulary, not just in business, but also in our personal lives. So where do we begin with such a big concept? And what are some of the steps we can take to explore our purpose and apply it to our lives? In Decoding Purpose, we unlock the minds of on-purpose activists, innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists, creatives, spiritual thinkers, and everything else in between. Welcome to the podcast, Decoding Purpose. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Today, I'm feeling the buzz of the festive season upon us, so what better time to have a little bit of fun and to celebrate your tribe, those special human beings who make your world go round. And in my case, that tribe happens to consist of some of the brightest minds on the planet, scientists, technologists, entrepreneurs and musicians who fundamentally believe that through intelligent optimism, we can, in fact, change the world and that the world is, in fact, already changing in the most miraculous of ways. That tribe is known as Future Crunch. Collectively, we believe that science and technology are creating a future that is more peaceful, connected and abundant. And we're determined to share that story via epic newsletters, jam-packed with good news stories from all over the world, keynote presentations, and we even fuse music with meaning as we lean into the intersection between performance and purpose. Today's guest on the podcast is the co-founder of Future Crunch and my valued partner in purpose, the incredible Dr. Angus Harvey. Gus and I were both incredibly excited to come together for this podcast to firstly celebrate the birth of his newborn daughter a couple of weeks ago, the newest member of our tribe, but to also decode turning points, mindset, the media and movements in our pursuit to unlock the power of both purpose and intelligent optimism. The most exciting part is that we also unpacked Future Crunch's brand new keynote presentation launching in 2020, the Adaptability Quotient. Why, you might ask? Two reasons, because we believe that adaptability is the most important skill for navigating the 21st century, and purpose is the anchor by which adaptability can thrive. So to stay in the spirit of adaptability, today I wanted to shake things up a little with the intro and to have some creative fun. And it just so happens that I am joined in the studio today by the most creative member of the Future Crunch team, our in-house musical philosopher, Will Tate. Will is the creative genius behind the keyboard performing with Future Crunch at prominent events in 2019, including TEDx Melbourne and Singularity U Australia. Will, it is awesome to have you here in the studio with me today. Can you share with our listeners why and how you have found purpose through fusing both music and meaning and what it is that you actually do on stage with with Gus and Tane? Thanks, Bex. Yes, great to be here in Sydney with you. And the answer to that question is that I've always felt the transformative power of music emotionally, and I've always been interested in ideas that can change our minds. And bringing those two together allows me to do on stage what I've always wanted to do in terms of helping create the kind of changes we need on this planet. And what I get to do on stage with Gus and Tane is to... to uh, around the great intellectual and visual ideas of, of, of what's going on inspirationally on this planet, I get to sort of connect with the audience about what that really means, what that feels like as a human being. And I do that both in addressing the audience and in creating songs that encapsulate the meaning uh, in a totally different way. And what is it about Future Crunch's purpose that really inspires you, drives you and lights up a sense of passion about what you do? Well, I've just 
always felt underneath all the stories that would seem to point at doom, at uh, the problems, the unsurmountable situations that we have on this planet, I've always felt that actually if we get our hearts and minds aligned, we can totally do this. And that's Future Crunch's core message. So when I was invited to to work with, with Gus and Tane, I immediately felt that I was at home. Now, I know that today you have a little bit of a surprise, not only for Gus, but also for our listeners. Um, now, normally I would, you know, introduce Gus doing the, the formal CV read through. But as it's nearly Christmas, I thought we could have a little bit more fun than that. And I know that you have put together a little 15 second intro song to bring in Dr. Angus Harvey in style. I do indeed. <clears throat> Happy Christmas, Gus. <clears throat> Dr. Gus, Dr. Gus, Dr. Gus, Harvey. He got his PhD in the global economy, but all the bad news made his heart bleed. Ah. Tani comes along and frames it positively. Future Crunch is born and the rest is history. A big thank you to Mr. Will Tate. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Angus Harvey. Thanks, Bex. Uh, I'm so glad that we've finally been able to make it happen. Me too. So, Gus, I want to start uh, with a question that I actually ask every single guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast. And what I'd like to know is whether you think that purpose is a kind of fate or a destiny, or is purpose an intentional and conscious decision? The answer, I think, Bex, to that question is uh, yes. Is yes? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and in the sense, in the, in the sense that uh, you could you could say that it's both of those things at the same time. Uh, I think that we tend to, as people to actually think in binaries. Um, we say it's either this or that, uh, and I think that when it comes to purpose, uh, it, it can be both of those things. It can be something that chooses you or something that you choose. Um, and I think what's so beautiful about uh, arriving on, you know, on a path that feels like um, it's a path driven by purpose is that it can often feel like both of those things at the same time. So it's very difficult to know when the moment was that you chose to to go on that path, or when or when or when that path chose you. They kind of blur together um, into the same kind of thing. Um, and I and I think in my case, um, that's certainly been been true. Um, and the reason that I say that is because um, it might have felt like a choice, but then then life, you know, a series of life incidents or series of, of things can happen um, that lead you to that choice. Um, mm. So it's, it's I, I guess it, it, it comes down to kind of bigger questions around the meaning of life and, and who we are, but uh, I think it's very difficult to separate them out. So Gus, as you know, I'm um, personally interested in, in really understanding and decoding the role of turning points and tipping points in our lives. And uh, the reason is because I've often found that these turning points lead to the activation of purpose. So I know that right now at this point in time, you are literally in one of those pivot points as we speak in becoming a new dad. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my partner Sammy and I are absolutely thrilled. Um, we, um, I became a dad to a beautiful, healthy baby girl two weeks ago, little Lola, um, and it's uh, it's it's um, it, it's it's mind bending. Yeah, um, it doesn't matter how many times people tell you about it. Uh, the experience of becoming a, a parent for the first time is quite literally indescribable. And so with that in mind, um, this is obviously a significant turning point. And, and in a conversation about purpose, I think becoming a new parent really brings that to the, to the core of, of everything that purpose is about. That said, I know you've had quite a few you know, pivotal moments or, or turning points over your life. Have you found that that has deepened your connection to purpose, those moments? <coughs> I'd say in my case, it's probably um, deepened an already existing commitment to, uh, to following to following that kind of path. Um, I, you know, I think 
um, obviously having a child is, is a huge turning point. Um, but it doesn't make me want to change or, or, or radically alter the path that I'm on. It just makes me more, it makes me feel more certain that what I'm doing um, is something that feels right and mm. something that, that feels like um, something that, that tr- truly fulfills me. So I was lucky enough to to see a new presentation that you did for our internal team a few weeks ago. And you had mentioned in that presentation that when you left university, despite always being the, you know, the classic A grade award winning student, you felt a little bit lost when you couldn't find a way to transform a master's in international political economy into purpose and and find a suitable job. I know this experience was confronting for you at the time, especially when for for so many years you believed that if you worked hard and met the traditional criteria of success that you would, of course, be successful. So how did this particular experience influence uh, the work that you do today with Future Crunch? So I, I think the, the experience that you're talking about is what was the experience that I had kind of d- during my 20s and, yeah. and into my early early 30s. Um, as you said, um, I, you know, I was I was lucky enough to be someone who was quite good at school, and um, I then translated that into being quite good at university, and and sort of just kept on jumping through the formal hoops that you jump through up through all the way into um, getting a PhD from the London School of Economics. Um, and I guess what had happened uh, over the course of, of my career up to that point is that I'd never really, well, I'd, I'd made choices for myself, but those choices had been dictated to and bound by convention. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd been told that um, from a very young age that, um, that, you know, if I did things in a certain way that I would always end up being rewarded for it. And I effectively rode that train for as long as I could possibly ride it for it until I got to the point where there was there was literally no more track. Mm. Um, you know, after I'd finished my PhD, it kind of um, the only thing after did, you know the only thing you can do after that is to carry on in an academic career. And I was pretty certain that I didn't want to do that. Um, what happened was it, it led to a major crisis of confidence because I had always defined my self worth um, and my impact in the world by how well I had performed inside large institutions. Mm. Um, and so though that was the feedback that I was looking for. Um, and then when I stepped out into the world to say, okay, who am I? What am I doing? And, and what, what can I, you know, what can I, tr- you know, what kind of impact can I make? Um, it, it, it turned out that the skills that I had learned had, had, had kind of ill prepared me for what was actually, you know, to, to get, the reality of, of what yeah, you the reality at of, that of, point in time, yeah. Yeah, of how difficult it is. And look, that's nothing new. Um, you know, every single person who leaves formal education experiences this in some form or the other. I think what made it so difficult in my case was that I was experiencing that at a much later stage in life. Um, and it was a real shock uh, to me. Yeah, well, well, I guess you would have had so much of your identity tied in into that way of thinking about the world. That's- yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think uh, that my identity had tied up into being my identity had been tied up into being smart. Yeah. Um, and so all of the feedback that I looked for was from from being you know trying to be smart. Um, and I think that's really where purpose comes into it. And, and what happened to me, the big turning point was was saying, all right, um, I have gotten to where I've gotten um, by this put to this point by being objective, rational, clear, balanced. Um, uh, you know, really sort of taking both sides into account by being logical, dispassionate, a number, a whole lot of adjectives that really describe what you would imagine is the perfect academic or the perfect researcher. Mm. And then I remember one day, you know, this is as the crisis was deepening and I was really sort of questioning who I was. And I, I wrote down all of those adjectives on a piece of paper. And then I sat down and I said, okay, who do I really want to be? And then on the other side of the piece of paper, on, on the opposite column, I wrote down, passionate, um, excited, um, you know, sort of wildly unrealistic, um, 
inspired, motivated, mm. uh, effectively all the opposite adjectives to the ones that I thought that I that I should be. And such emo- emotionally charged words as well, opposed yeah. to logical framed, you uh, know, a language with a framework. You're talking about how you want it to feel and be in the world. Absolutely. Mm. And then I looked at the two columns and the column on the left was the column that I'd always thought that I was supposed to be because that's what I've been told. And then when I looked at the column on the right hand side, I thought, I, I don't, I, that's what I, I want to be. A, I don't want to be that. Um, I want to be doing those things. I want people to say those things about me. Mm. Um, and also that I want to experience those things in my own life. Um, so that's when I decided, all right, um, I, I think this whole logical, calm, objective, perfectly rational um, side of me needs to, I need to say goodbye to that and, mm. and embrace, um, embrace a, a, I suppose, a life of purpose. Absolutely. And it's something I have found in conversations I've had with people about purpose and in my own experience is generally there is this point in time where you're really asked to question your identity. And in some part, who you thought you were kind of gets pulled away to enable that bigger purpose to come through. And you almost have to get out of your own way to let that happen. And and it sounds like to me, you know, you had all of these stories running around who you were and what success meant, but really for Future Crunch to come through, for your mission in life, your greater purpose to, to be seen, you had to really tap into the energy of that purpose, the feeling, the emotion and who you wanted to be and let go of the old story of who you thought you were. That's right. And, and, Next, what's what's wonderful about that is this yeah. is at the core of all of our greatest stories. Mm. Um, if you look at any any fantastic story, any of our most loved stories as as a species, um, as human beings, um, all of those great stories involve someone changing because they've had to question who they were. And so. I now want to talk about that greater purpose and that greater mission. Now, I, of course, know everything there is to know about Future Crunch, but (laughs) for the sake of our listeners, I'd love for you to explain what Future Crunch is, what it represents, and and to talk me through the moment where you and Tane made the decision that Future Crunch was, in fact, your dharma. So Future Crunch was was born out of a, a feeling that I had that, um, the stories that we were seeing and that the, the stories we were seeing about people and uh, around the world somehow didn't um, convey the full picture. Mm. Um, and what had happened is that in, in my academic career, I'd spent so long looking at the problems that I'd actually forgotten how to look at solutions, which is what I was really interested in. It was the exact reason why I'd gotten into studying in the first place. I, I wanted to understand how to make the world a better place. Um, with Future Crunch, um, once I started researching stories around science and technology and stories of human progress, I started to discover that, that there was there were far more stories of human progress out there than 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 I'd sort of initially been mm. led to believe. Mm. Um, and at around that time, as I was starting to kind of discover that there's this whole different story about the world out there, um, I met Tane. Um, and Tane is a cancer scientist, and so as a scientist, he had a very different view of the world. He, um, you, you know, as a scientist, he was inherently solutions focused. Um, he was interested in creating solutions to to solve challenges, and that really appealed to me. That kind of mindset. And so the two of us were on a bike ride. Um, we were we were friends first uh, in the high country of Victoria in Australia. And um, we'd started talking about all these different stories of human progress that I've been researching. And he started telling me stories of how science and technology were being used to do some truly incredible mm. things in our time. Um, and when we kind of put those two things together, we thought, wow, this is a great um, new story that, that maybe um, people would enjoy. Um, and so we did a talk for some friends and family just uh, as a whim, on a whim. Um, and one person, someone who saw that talk thought, this, um, this is great. Um, uh, could you please come and do this for my organization? Um, and the rest was history. Um, so we ended up building a think tank um, that, uh, that uh, a sort of a thought leadership business. Um, and we've now spoken uh, um, at more than 300 events on five different continents. Um, we've built a, a substantial online following 
who really enjoy hearing stories of human mm. progress and mind-blowing science and technology. Um, and we're slowly now starting to expand that movement out uh, into to a much wi wider tribe of people that really believe in this idea of intelligent optimism, this idea of looking at the world through a lens of, um, of sort of evidence-based optimism uh, where, um, you know, we've got great stories about what people are doing backed by gold-plated research and, and, and statistics and evidence. And I, and I want to unpack uh, intelligent optimism uh, through quite a few lenses in a moment. But before doing so, I just want to jump back into the early days with Future Crunch. Because mm. what I'm really interested to know is if, if I'm a person who really wants to bring through a, a big purpose, something like Future Crunch, which really at the heart of Future Crunch, <coughs> we have a movement of optimism, which you've just shared with us. When you look back to that time, was there like this innate knowing like that this was your purpose? Did, like, how did that feel? Or did you find you were a little bit clouded in, in moments of doubt as well? Look, I, I didn't ever think about it like that. Mm. Um, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't have a blinding moment of inspiration and say, right, that's mm. what I'm going to do. Um, for me, it was more a case of saying, for me, it was actually about consistency. Um, probably one of the most important podcasts I've ever listened to uh, was a conversation uh, with, a, with a tech entrepreneur, a guy called Derek Sivers uh, in 2014. Um, and he was being interviewed um, on a podcast and the interviewer said to him, what's the most important lesson you've learned in life? And he said something that I, I will never, ever forget. Uh, and it's still for me, probably the most powerful piece of advice I've ever been given, mm. which is that it's not what you know, it's what you do regularly that counts. Mm, it's how you show and, up. Yeah, and it was like, it, it was like fire, it was like, it was like a, a light bulb going off in my head. And what I realized is that, that I knew all these incredible stories about human progress and all these great facts and figures about science and technology. And I had this view of the world and I had this vision and, and this idea. But I realized that if I couldn't get that out of my head and if I couldn't get it out to a wider audience consistently, um, mm. you know, regularly every day or every week or every fortnight, whatever it might be, then nobody was going to be able to trust me to actually deliver that message. Mm. And so for me, purpose is actually about consistency. It's not about inspiration. Um, the other nice analogy that I really enjoy here uh, is that, you know, if you are looking to, if you're trying to look after your teeth, um, yes, and you're trying to have, have you know, um, great dental health. Um, you, all of us think that it's important to go to the dentist, which it is, but actually the thing that gives you great teeth is uh, if you brush your teeth every day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But no one, but no one thinks about that. That's they think right. it's all about that, that big visit to the dentist. And I think it's true when it comes to purpose as well. We think about that big event or that viral clip or that, um, I don't know, that one document that's really going to distill everything down. And I actually think that when it comes to purpose, it's about regular consistency and, and doing things um, all the time regularly um, and with predictability so that your wider audience um, can trust or, you. Or, yeah, can trust yeah, you. Absolutely. And I mean, consistency is, is such a key tool in influence and thought leadership. The other thing I love about what you're saying is whilst I think we can experience a sense of joy when we're pursuing our purpose, purpose isn't always necessarily that light, fluffy, inspirational joy. Sometimes purpose actually asks us to to step into resilience in order to be able to adapt or move or go to the next level, and we can only do that with mm. consistency. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Mm. And, uh, and, I, and, and that's true of so many things that, that are worth doing. So, Gus, I now want to dive into the philosophy of intelligent optimism. And what I want to unpack with you is, is the purpose of intelligent optimism in three ways. Those three ways are to look at the mindset of optimism, optimism and the media, and finally, optimism as a movement. So, as you know, you and I have had a great friendship. Uh, over the last few years, and I think there's probably been times for both of us where we've had to adapt to make shitty situations great. Uh, and I know for me personally, the philosophy of Future Crunch has really helped me to navigate those pivot points because I shifted into a mindset of optimism and a mm. fundamental belief that 
okay, things can happen, things can be difficult, but my world is not on fire and I can choose how I see these situations in my life. And, you know, look, that's not to deny the impact of hardship or trauma when it hits us. But what, mm. I'm, what I'm interested to know is how can we use an optimistic mindset to deal with a crisis or to navigate change, whether that be personally or professionally, or to generally improve our, our outlook in life? Uh, what are your thoughts with regards to optimism as a mindset? And um, I bet there would be a little bit of science behind that way of thinking <laughs> as well. <laughs> Uh, well, there is. Um, so let, let, let me speak to the first part of yeah. that and then, then I'll talk a little bit about the science. Um, the, I think optimism as a mindset is, is it, this sounds so simple as to almost be ridiculous, but it's, it's understanding that optimism is a choice uh, that you can make about how you navigate the world and it's not a reaction to the world around you. And that's very different to the way that we think that most people think about optimism. Mm. You know, when they say, when they say, when you think about reasons to be cheerful, um, people will often sort of say, well, look, here's a long list of reasons that you should be cheerful. And they'll, or maybe you're talking about gratitude journaling, for example, um, you know, which is obviously very popular where people sort of say, if you can bring gratitude into your life, you know, you'll have more reasons to be optimistic or you'll feel better about it. So what's interesting about a lot of those um, ways of looking at things are, uh, they, they are external events or external characteristics or um, qualities or um, situations in your life that you are then sort of saying, okay, given the, these list of all these great things, um, I am going to therefore feel optimistic. So it's an outside-in movement. And I think what's so powerful about optimism as a mindset is that that's an inside-out um, right. energetic flow. Yeah. And so what happens there is you say, look, I'm not going to, my optimistic mindset is not going to be dependent on, you know, the great things that are happening in my life or the things that I should be grateful for or, or my health or my family or my career going well. Um, it's just a permanent mindset that I have. And once you choose, it's almost like switching your brain on from, um, I don't know, choose whatever color you want, but say it's switching your brain from blue to yellow, um, so to sort of think about your brain always being on a, in a particular color, um, uh, whatever a happy color is to you, mm. to me, it happens to be yellow. And so I sort of think about when I leave the door that I've kind of got this maybe yellow glow coming out of my head or um, that I've got a, a glow coming from my heart. Or so it's a choice that I make every day when I step out. And what's really interesting about making that choice is over time it becomes a habit, so you don't even need to think about it anymore. Um what happens is that once you make that decision to to look at the world optimistically, you suddenly start seeing things that were never there before. Um, and so it becomes this this beautiful feedback loop. Uh, the decision to be optimistic causes you to see more more uh, more things that are good, that are fantastic, that give you hope, that um, give you encouragement, that give That's you inspiration. Right. And then that makes you feel more cheerful or more optimistic. Um, and then so the sort of cycle starts again. So once you make the decision to be optimistic from the inside out, then that outside inflow kind of completes the loop. And, you know, I think, it again, it's interesting to look at optimism through the framework of purpose because we can make the assumption that purpose is always good because it's so often associated with solving social problems as one example. But the truth is purpose is neither bad or good. Where purpose is really powerful is if we can pair it with optimism, if we can mm. channel it in a way that really creates hopeful, abundant and brighter outcomes for the future. Yeah, that's right. And these aren't just words. I mean, look, mm. if you say to someone, do you want a, a more hopeful, brighter and more abundant future? No one's going to disagree with you on that. That's exactly right. Um, so I think we're up to, you know, what's really important is to is to combine this optimism with with really great kind of evidence, um, and also understanding that there, there's a really strong scientific basis for thinking this way as well. Um, it, it this isn't about kumbaya and holding hands and, and sort of shutting our eyes and saying, uh, look, everything's going to be no fantastic. unicorns and rainbows for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's so important because um, unicorns and rainbows yeah. um, aren't going to they're, they're not sustainable. That's right. Um, for I think what the kinds of things that sustain me is that that you know the, there are now scientific evidence showing that an optimistic mindset leads to longer health spans, um, leads to better social connection leads to uh, longer-term success in people's careers, 
um, that there's a, a sort of a pretty pretty strong evidence to suggest that this is actually a really great life choice. Um, and then also that there's a lot of really strong evidence to suggest that there's a lot of things to be optimistic about, about the state of the world in 2019. Um, that there are some really extraordinary things happening out there that, that give us really good reasons to believe that the future is going to be a better place. So, Gus, earlier this year, I was honoured to sit in on a podcast interview that you and Tane did with one of my previous guests on the podcast, uh, Julie Masters, and and Jules Mm. is the host of Inside Influence. It was an epic interview that, amongst other things, explored what you coined the information diet. And uh, to summarise, this was an exploration of good versus bad information being consumed in the same way we might consume a balanced diet. In your opinion, why is it so important that we have an awareness of the information that we consume and and what are some practical tips for breaking out of bad news habits that pretty much leave us feeling like crap? Mm. So what's what's happened in the last 10 years is there's been an explosion of information thanks to the digital revolution and and connectivity and and the rise of social media networks. Uh, Information was something that used to be quite rare and quite scarce. Um, information is now something that is incredibly abundant. Uh, there, there is more. There are more blog posts, um, gifts, uh, TikTok um, videos, and you know, Facebook photos than you could possibly consume in a day. Uh, that that happened in a minute than than you could consume in an entire lifetime. So we kind of had this explosion of information. And what happens is when you have a lot of information out there, the value of information changes. Uh, in the old days, when there wasn't much information around, when you know, when you you relied on, let's say, books or, um, you know, sort of the earlier versions of the internet, or um, you know, that there wasn't this abundance of information, the, the value of its of information was its accuracy and its usefulness. Today, because there's so much information out there, the value of information becomes its, um, its its sort of ability to attract your attention. Mm. And so, what that means is that most of the information now is guided by market forces to be kind of low quality information. It's like the um, diet equivalent of jelly babies and corn syrup. Yeah, Ma- um, McDonald's. Or, K- or KFC, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's engineered to be addictive. Um, and so it might give you a short term hit, but in the long term it has no nutritional value. And so once, once I realized that, I started trying to think about how I consume information uh, in the same way that I think about how I manage my diet, um, instead of consuming just whatever is in front of me, I started to say to myself, can I consume information that is high quality, that is useful, that um, has this kind of quality of intelligent optimism, and it's information that I can use to guide um, better long-term decisions. And so that meant moving away from sort of the junk food information like social media or um sort of sensationalist news Mm. and moving towards longer form content, for example, like great quality podcasts like this one or um, email newsletters or books. Um, And once I made that change, um, it really had such a strong effect on my life. Um, It it made me feel healthier in the same way that changing your diet to include more greens and grains and, and, um, you know, more vegetables will make you feel healthier. And I mean, to, to give some context here, I was having a read that you've got a great article on the information diet, which is available on the, the Future Crunch website, which I'd recommend everyone check out. Um, you might have to correct me, Gus, but I think the statistic I read in that article was that, and it was quoted by a psychologist, Michelle Gillen, I think was her name, but that uh, a dose of bad news in the morning can decrease the likelihood of us having a good day by 27%. That's right. That's right. It's exactly what I was talking about earlier. Is that if you're relying on the, uh, on outside, you know, if you are relying on outside information to determine mm. your mindset, um, a piece of bad news like that can affect your entire day. And I think it's um, this is interesting again because in in the age of purpose, if you think about it through the context of where we put our attention. Um, it's so important to know why you were seeking out information uh, so that when you go on to social media or your digital platforms, you're not letting those platforms dictate where your attention goes. You have clarity of purpose around why you're there so that you can intentionally seek out that good information. Mm. 
That's so right. And then also, this is such a crucial point, Bex. Mm. It's not about putting your blinkers on and saying, I'm just going to only look at great stuff and I'm not going to look at any of the, the terrible things or any, or any bad news that's going on. What it means is that you can actually look at both. Yeah. Because once, because once you've changed your information diet to be able to include better high-quality information, more good news, more stories of progress, more stories of inspiration, you're then able to come back and, and eat a little bit of junk food every now and again. In the same way that, you know, it's still really great to eat a tub of ice cream at night or, um, I don't know, go out to McDonald's or KFC and, and have, a, have a, a, a cheeky burger. So this is not about totally excluding um, all kinds of information and only, ex- uh, you know, focusing on the Kumbaya stuff because that's, that's, that's also biased. Mm. What it's about is it's about balancing out your information diet. And I think that's a really crucial distinction. And look, that's a great segue to my next point, because as much as there are amazing things happening in the world and and Future Crunch are all about showcasing those stories, at the same time, at this particular point in human history, if we turn on the news, we are seeing most of the Australian East Coast burning, uh, while on the other side of the world, we are seeing floods, temperatures are increasing, sea levels are rising, and, um, you know, only in November, 11,000 scientists endorsed a global climate emergency declaration. So these are just a few examples of very, you know, very real facts and, and a crisis for our planet. The facts are confronting. So how can igniting a movement of optimism assist us in inspiring the change that we do in fact need for the people on the planet? Um, look, I'm, I'm so glad you, you, you've brought up those stories, Bex, and, and it is true. Um, you know, the way I... I think the best characterization I can make of this is that as a species, um, we've done really well at looking after each other and ourselves. Mm. You know, wars, war is declining, diseases are disappearing. Um, you know, we're seeing increased tolerance around the world. Um, you know, so there are a lot of fantastic indicators for human beings. But when it comes to the environment, uh, we are fouling our own nest. Yeah. Um, and no species does that intentionally. Uh, what's happened, and so we're finding it very difficult to sort of shift the Titanic uh, away from cruising towards the iceberg. Mm. And it's shifting slowly, but it's not shifting fast enough. So, where Future Crunch comes in, and what we see as our purpose is that we need to start telling different stories about whether this shift is actually possible. Uh, Future Crunch is about telling new stories about the 21st century stories of human progress because. If we can't change the stories we're telling, uh, telling, uh, telling, um, telling about ourselves, then we're not going to be able to change the story and give ourselves a vision of where we want to go. And uh, uh, to use an analogy, maybe a sort of you know of, of a small tribe. If you think about human, you know, human beings as as a person um, or as a tribe, uh, we, we're engaged in a lot of negative self-talk at the moment. Mm. And as you know, if someone is, has got a lot of negative, negative self-talk going on, it's very difficult for them to break themselves out of their bad habits. And so Future Crunch is really about trying to break the habit of negative self-talk, but for the human race as a whole. Yeah. And so it's all about telling stories of why the human race is getting it right or how, story, or how change is possible or about the millions of people who are working to actually try and ch- change the course of this ship and to stop it from steering into the iceberg. And what happens is that we believe that igniting the movement of this is going to be incredibly powerful because the more people that are telling these stories, the, the, the further that message can spread. So really our vision is we would love to see, you know, tens of thousands of people um, being future crunch facilitators and, and um, sparks in the night who are able to sort of say, well, look, there, there are some, some fantastic stories about how the, the ship is steering in the right direction. And the more people that can start telling those stories, we believe um, the, the more people will believe that this thing is actually possible and that will lead to, to real action. Absolutely. And, and what I love about uh, Future Crunch is, like every great movement, there is a me in the movement. And, you know, it, it is as simple as breaking it down and thinking about optimism as a mindset. As you've already said today, getting really intentional about the information we choose to bring into our world and then finally getting conscious about the, the information and the stories we share with others. Mm. And then just saying, look, uh, you have a choice here. 
Yeah. Um, do do you want to be part of the group that sits there cynically um, standing on the sidelines and saying, oh, well, you know, whatever, we knew this was going to happen anyway? Or do you want to be part of the group that says, uh, no, we, we were there. We're, we're going to try and change this story. We're going to be actively working every day to try and shift the course of the ship. Um, you, it, you know, choose which camp you, you want to be in. Mm. Uh, I think for, for us, that choice was fairly easy. Yeah, and look, I, I just want to hone in on business for a moment because I read another article on your website and I think you had some really great, well, on the Future Crunch website that had a few really great examples of this change happening in business and it was called Power to Change and it focused in on renewable energy. So I, I was interested because in that article you spoke about a few really innovative companies like I think IKEA was one example that have really mm. started to focus in on our renewable energies and and. It just got me thinking about, well, what is it that really sparks that change in business? Um, because I know there's so many economic reasons why we should choose clean energy, yet there seems to be a lag for some companies. It does, but I think what's really interesting is we're now increasingly seeing this kind of purpose-driven movement really enter the workplace yeah. um, and be seen as good business, not in the sense that it's good for the bottom line, uh, although it turns out it is, as as I know that you've covered on this podcast before. Yeah. Um, but that actually, it's sort of what is the whole point of business in the first place? Mm. Um, you know, can business move beyond the transactional and make way for the transformational? And the answer to that is that, yes, of course, business can. Um, and I think increasingly we're starting to see business leaders around the world, everyone from Volkswagen, which is, you know, the largest car manufacturer in the world, it accounts for 1% of global carbon emissions, through to Walmart, uh, who say that they are no longer going to be selling assault rifles. Mm. Um, these are companies that are making these decisions based not just on a bottom line, but based on a, a deep-seated question of saying, who are we and what is our point? Uh, what's the point of this business even existing if we can't kind of bring these changes into, into, into being? And I think with that move, we're also in some cases seeing the rise of of I guess, corporate activism, for want of a better word, where we're seeing these big big brands also have an opinion about the state of the world, which I've, I fi- find quite fascinating. It is. And I think that's a recognition that, that big businesses aren't these sort of faceless, um, monolithic, um, sort of impenetrable entities, that these are the, that behind any business name are real people who are making real decisions. Uh, and I think that what's been so great about corporate activism um, is, is that recognition that, that corporations can have personalities and that they can have opinions and points of view. And I, and I think that's a welcome change. It's something that I, I think is, is very healthy for, uh, for capitalism. And, you know, I think it doesn't matter whether it's personal or business. The one thing that binds human beings uh, is, is storytelling and, and to – Requote uh, you from earlier in the podcast. You said if we want to change the story of the human race in the twenty first century, we have to change the stories we tell ourselves. And and I do think that storytelling is the one thing that connects us at every level. So mm. I'm really interested to to understand a little bit more about the science of storytelling. Why is it that stories bind us? <laughs> Stories bind us because language and communication is still. Uh, you know, it's the most powerful innovate. It's the most powerful evolutionary adaptation that that human beings have ever made. Mm. Um, and so, all everything that human beings do, or or everything that so many of the things that make us distinct from uh, that make us distinct, that give us consciousness, that create community, that um, give us purpose. So many of those things can be traced back to language and to storytelling. Um, and what it means is that, um, you know, evolutionarily, we are um, intrinsically ad- attracted to story. We get it. Um, we know story. It feels familiar to us. There are story tropes. There are story traditions. There are um, ways that make stories make us feel that are very old um, mm. and that go all the way down through thousands of generations. Um, so in, in many senses, um, in, in business and in the wider, um, so when, when it comes to purpose more generally, yeah. um, storytelling isn't, isn't just a, 
it's not just the skill, it's kind of like the, the be all and end all really. Um, it, it's so, you know, so many of our constructs, uh, modern constructs, everything from money to politics to law, they're all stories too. And so when it comes to purpose or um, what the future of the human race is or whether human progress is happening or, um, you know, um, what, what the point of business is, that, that mm. comes back to storytelling as well. And what's so great about storytelling is that it's a, it, is a, it is something that you can get better at. It's something you can study. Um, you know, there's a, there are ways of crafting stories, having a beginning, a middle, and an end. There are ways of um, dividing stories up. There are narrative arcs that you can employ in different senses. Um, storytelling, it's like a paintbrush, and you can use that paintbrush to tr um, try many different colors on a canvas. And it means that you're not just reporting statistics or evidence. You're couching those statistics or those evidence for your point of view um, in, in, in a form that allows people to actually digest it. So, Gus, I read an extract from an, an, an article the other day that said this. From Gates to Jobs to Zuckerberg, young tech, tech entrepre entrepreneurs fueled by aggressive capital investment have reshaped every aspect of our lives at unprecedented speed. But they didn't grow up in the era of Greta Thunberg's army. The next wave of tech unicorns will no doubt be social entrepreneurs fueled by a new purpose of impact investment. The result will be widespread disruption to our sector. Now, never before have we had the technology, the resources, the access, and as individuals, the voice to be the change, just like Future Crunch. So with the fusion of these trends, do you think we are entering a new age of acti activism? And, and how, in your opinion, will this disrupt business as usual? Look, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think what's interesting about these questions is, it's often helpful to, to to put these questions into context. Mm. So, so the answer to that question is that yes, um, in modern Western liberal societies with democratic norms, um, institutions uh, with governance systems that we're familiar with, and often in English-speaking countries, um, or sort of uh, you know, I, I suppose you could call it modern Western liberal countries and democracies. Those those things, those things might be true, that we might be seeing a new breed of um, sort of activist-led movements, um, you know, new forms of disruption that have these kind of social movements at their core, mm. um, new, new kinds of companies that have purpose built into them right at their very foundation. Um, I think that might very well be true. But the more interesting question to me is, is um, what, it, what we're looking at worldwide, because... Mm. The population of modern Western liberal democracies still only, it only accounts for about uh, a tenth of the world's entire population. Yeah. Um, what's really interesting to me is to sort of say what kinds of social movements enabled by digital technologies and connectivity are we going to start seeing in places like China and India, um, which account for, you know, um, between the two of them, they account for three billion people. Um, and so that's the kind of change that, that really moves the dial in terms of the future of the human race. Um, you know what? Um, what kind of what kind of surges? Um, what kind of new forms of capitalism are going to arise out of those places? Mm. And I don't know. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, but that is going to actually determine how things play out from here on in. So yes, it's it's very important that Greta Thunberg and and that the entire generation of climate activists are um, doing their best to try and move the dial, but. Um, remember that China and India account, um, you know, that China accounts for the majority of global carbon emissions, and we haven't seen anything like a climate activism movement emerge in China yet. Yeah, where well, that's and that's really, what that that's got, really exciting because yeah. what happens if that movement now emerges out of somewhere like China, where where most people in China are connected and have mobile phones? Um, is is there room for those kinds of movements in places that we might least expect them in places like Latin America? 400 to 500 million people in places like Ethiopia. Um, there are 100 million people there. What happens when most people in the world are connected with high-speed connectivity? Um, what kinds of new forms of movement and social movements can we see then?
and this is kind of separate to what you're saying now, but it makes me realise that it's so important to really keep our eyes on the pulse of what's happening in these other countries, which I know Future Crunch do so well. Um, you know, Have you heard any stories from like India or China that, that really point towards these shifts happening in your research with Future Crunch? Mm, so many. Um, you yeah. know, one of the big sh- one of the big things that is really sweeping the world at the moment is, is the idea of tree planting yeah. um, as a solution to many of our environmental problems. Uh, you know, earlier this year we saw Ethiopia um, plant 350 million trees in 12 hours, which is a staggering achievement. Um, you know, Ethiopia is a place that most people um, don't know anything about, mm. um, and it turns out that it's a country of over 100 million people. Um, you know, with a, a wide range of different um, sort of uh, geographic features, um, an incredibly rich culture spe- stretching back, you know, thousands of years. Um, and it's a country that's got its own cultural and economic and political history that so many people are totally unfamiliar with. Um, so tree planting happening in Ethiopia, um, large tree planting movements happening across India, um, India uh, and across Pakistan. Um, we've, we've seen New Zealand recently announced that they're going to be planting a billion trees in the next decade. Uh, in the UK, there's a big tree planting movement that's now spinning up as well. And China uh, is also um, planting trees at incredibly, um, at, you know, pl- China forests are expanding China at the rate of about 2,400 square kilometers a year. Um, so these are stories that we don't often hear about. Uh, France has um, managed to, uh, France, France's forests have expanded by about 30, from 7% to 31% of total land area in the last 20 years. Um, these are stories that don't make it onto the mainstream radar, that don't make it onto mainstream media news websites, um, but they're incredibly important and, and they can be incredibly powerful. The world is adapting, which um, brings me to the next part of, of the interview. I was lucky enough to see you present Future Crunch's brand new topic, the adaptability quotient, a few weeks ago. Uh, The theme of AQ is that the most important skill for the 21st century is, in fact, adaptability. So I have a few questions on this topic that I wanted to unpack with you. And the first question being, what is the adaptability quotient and why is AQ so vital for the future of work and the next economy? Look, I'm so excited about this uh, this new avenue of research. And the reason I'm excited about it is because it says something that's unexpected about the world. It kind yeah. of um, challenges conventional thinking. Uh, in the last decade or so, m- many people have kind of... Um, uh, they, they've, um, they've taken in this idea of the 10,000 hours, um, that in order to be an expert in something, in order to be successful, yeah. you have to do your 10,000 hours and then you are a specialist in that field, and then that sets you up for success. Uh, there is now an increasing body of evidence, a new range of research, showing that this is actually not the case at all, uh, and that the, the most successful people increasingly are people who have tried many different things and who combine a little bit of expertise in a lot of different areas. Um, and most importantly, people who are um, able to adapt and change and who... Um, don't see a problem in doing that. Uh, and what this means is that um, the, the most powerful skill, in the 20th century, the most powerful skill was efficiency, um, the ability to be proficient, to be productive, to be highly efficient, um, to get the best results um, in a particular area. The most important skill for the 21st century is adaptability, which is, in many senses, can, can often be the opposite of efficiency. Mm. Um, and the... So they're now using this research in recruiting for military um, in the United States. They're saying that uh, instead of um, you know having someone who is going to be a specialist, let's say on a boat in the Navy, um, you know at operating one particular um, thing, or you know being a gunner or being the chef, um, they're now training people in the U.S. military to be proficient across five or six different skill areas. Yep. And what that means is that people are able to bring insights from different areas um, to create unexpected solutions um, to sort of see problems in a new light. So, Gus, basically what we have there is diversity in innovation in that adaptability allows us to to see projects, things, situations with, uh, you know, with a different perspective. That's right. And the... 
it, it's um they're they're calling this the adaptability quotient. So in the same sense that you you had IQ, uh, which apparently uh, um, determines your intelligence quotient, although increasingly that looks like it's um, uh, a sort of an old, outdated measure um, for intelligence. And then more recently, we've had EQ, which is your uh, emotional quotient, which is your ability to empathize and connect and work in teams and um, you know have human you know human centered workplaces. Uh, they're now talking about AQ which is your adaptability quotient, which is your ability to adapt to change, your ability to take new challenges and ride with them, your ability to um, bring innovative thinking uh, to different situations, employing skills from multiple different areas. So, Gus, I think when we look at our connection to purpose, we like to think of it as an anchor or, you know, some people call purpose the North Star. Do you think there is a connection between a sense of purpose uh, being an anchor that it then enables us to adapt? Absolutely. And, and that's why purpose is so powerful. Yeah. Uh, as you said, it gives you that North Star. And if you've got your North Star, then you can take any road, um, any road you like. Um, and that road can meander. Um, you can go off path. You can, um, you know, you can take um, different forks in the road, but you're always able to come back to that north star and keep heading in, in generally in the right direction. Um, purpose is actually what allows for adaptability, mm. because if you know the ultimate direction that you're headed in, um, then then that allows you to try many different ways of getting there. Uh, and I think that's what's so powerful about it. Purpose isn't a skill that you can, that you need to learn. Um, it's not a profession that you need to enter. It, it's something that's with you always, um, and it, it allows for greater adaptability um, and and um, and provides optimism um, and allows for that optimistic mindset. Um, so if you combine those three things together, the uh, intelligent optimism, um, a high adaptability quotient, and true purpose, I mean that North Star, you combine those three things together, and that's like um, that's like you know that's a superpower. Mm. So one of the things I love, not only about the adaptability quotient, but also Future Crunch's broader message is the idea that despite emerging technologies like blockchain or artificial intelligence driving rapid transformation, counterintuitively, new technology is actually just placing a magnifying glass on what it means to be human. And it's a magnifying glass that is amplified if we consider the implications of, say, AI. Now, where I'm really interested to go with this with you is a few weeks ago I interviewed Jamie Skeller, and I think you may know Jamie, and mm -hmm. he was talking about Elon Musk's multiplanetary theory, which um, I'm sure you have heard of, and uh, in the interview he basically said that the future of being human may be human consciousness existing as a part of technology especially if we are wanting to exist on other planets. So he basically was suggesting that it is possible that in the future humanity could actually exist in, say, AI or other forms that exist beyond the physical body. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is I know Future Crunch is not in the business of making predictions and that we're <laughs> extremely focused on what is happening right now. But I'm really curious to know whether you've reflected on, on any of these ideas and if you had a point of view with regards to where all of this is potentially going. Look, te technology, we tend to think that technology is something outside of us. Yeah. Um, you know, that technology is... is um, something outside of us, it's robots or it's computers or it's space rockets or it's virtual reality um, and that there's something unnatural about technology. Uh, you see this a lot in conversations these days, you know, that, that, our, that kids are using phones and this is unnatural and that it's somehow preventing them from reaching their true purpose or it's preventing them from connecting with each other. Um, but technology isn't unnatural. Te technology isn't inhuman technology is human technology is to human beings as nests are to birds as dams are to beavers uh, i mean our ancestors were just apes that mm. got lost between the forest and the river and they accidentally invented um, stone age tools they invented antibiotics and nuclear weapons um, technology is a tool that human beings have always used to overcome our biggest challenges and that's why it's always been an intimate part of the story of human evolution. 
And so whenever I think about technology or whenever it comes up in conversations, um, I always try to remind myself that technology is human. Um, that there is not actually any distinction between those two things. So, Gus, at the end of every year, Future Crunch release a, a really popular article highlighting 99 good news stories from that year. Now, I would imagine that you're pulling uh, the 2019 version version together as we speak. So uh, I know you shared some amazing stories uh, with, with us earlier in the podcast, but I'm wondering if you have a favourite good news story from 2019 that you want to um, share with us or whether we have to wait for the article. <laughs> um, I, I am pulling the article, article together as we speak. Um, it's going to be coming out um, on uh, Friday, the thirteenth of December. Amazing! So get um, on Future Crunch over across social media and sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, that's right. It'll be on the website. Um, it'll be on all our social media feeds. It'll be really easy to find. Um, some favourite stories from this year. Um, there's pro- look, I, I think I have, um, I'm just trying to think uh, what my favourite story, but maybe my two favourite stories this year. Um, one is that Save the Children released a new report um, showing that children's lives have improved in 173 out of 176 countries that they surveyed over the last decade. Um, and the, That's awesome. They, the lives of children, they're talking about disease, they're talking about child slavery, they're talking about um, better outcomes, they're talking about education, um, across the range of different indicators that you use when it comes to children, unequivocally, the lives of children on planet Earth have improved drastically in the last decade. Um, we're talking about tens of thousands of children um, in countries like Cambodia that have been rescued from child slavery, millions of children who've um, avoided diseases like malaria um, or uh, tuberculosis or pneumonia um, and millions of children's lives that have been saved um, and many children that are grown up in more tolerant and more inclusive societies. Um, and I think that report by Save the Children uh, was astonishing and it mm. got almost no media coverage, which was very sad. How is that possible? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. Anyway, it's okay. It'll be in the 99 news. It'll be in the 99 stories. And my other favorite story from this year was that the population of humpback whales, um, humpback whales were critically endangered um, by the end of the 1980s. Um, and the population of humpback whales has increased to almost the same level that it was before whaling began in the 19th century. That, that shows what can be done, doesn't it? Uh, you know, we, whaling used to be something that everyone did. Um, there were no taboos against it, um, but an environmental movement that was global in nature sprang up. Um, it's you know it made hunting whales morally abhorrent, um, and it also um, we invented new products and new technologies that meant we didn't need to use whales um, and use products from whales anymore. Um, and today, the population of whales of humpback whales is almost back to what it was before we started hunting them. So, Gus, I'm at my final question today, and um, I want to celebrate the birth of your brand new daughter. So, with (laughs) with that in mind, what what (laughs) three things do you want your little girl to know about the discovery of her purpose? (laughs) Um, Wow, what a great question! (laughs) It does it does distill a point of view. This question. I would love to know that purpose is available to everyone, doesn't matter what your age, gender, creed, religious belief, nationality, race happens to be. Um, that purpose is something that unites us. It's, it's something that's inherently human, and that it's something that every single person on the planet, all 7.5 billion of us, uh, can find and achieve. Uh, I would like her to know that purpose is uh, it's not a nice to have. Um, it's not it's not a you know an additional skill or a life hack that you can employ um, it's something that goes right to the core of who we are and why we're here on planet earth um, and I'd like her to know that it, it can be really fun mm. um, you know that we don't have to be po-faced and um, all serious and you know give everyone stern lectures um, that we can bring to purpose the lightheartedness, the wonder, the magic, and the silliness of being human. 
um, and that um, it can be as fun and as light as we want to make it and it can be as heavy and serious as we need to make it in those times as well um, and that it's something that, that can always be with us in the moments of joy and in the moments that are very difficult as well. Well, what a beautiful piece of advice. And and I bet you're in a world of wonder as a new dad as well um, and enjoying the purpose of of being a parent. Uh, It's magic. (laughs) Uh, It's it's better than anyone could ever have uh, explained or described. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gus, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Um, I'm going to let you go back to your parenting duties, but it's been such a joy to have you on Decoding Purpose. Thanks, Bex. It's been wonderful to have this conversation. Um, and and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I look forward, uh, look forward to, to more of this work together. Absolutely. The journey has just begun. Thank you, Angus Harvey. Dr. Gus, Dr. Gus, Dr. Gus Harvey. He got his PhD in the global economy, but all the bad news made his heart bleed. Ah! Tani comes along and frames it positively. Future Crunch is born and the rest is history. 